Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Katie Clark, and on behalf of the California and Northwest chapters of the Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums, I am so delighted to welcome you to the third in our fantastic lecture series with Liz Love this morning. Thank you so much for being here. If, uh, if you're on the West Coast, good morning. If you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. And if you're joining us from, uh, from Europe, from the UK, from anywhere else, good evening or whatever time of day it is where you are. We're so pleased to have you here. And we're so excited to bring you yet another fantastic talk. Um, this, as you'll recall, is the third in our series. We've got one more. Um, so please make sure you mark your calendar for next week at the same time uh, to catch our fourth and final lecture in this series. Just a quick reminder before we jump in that your sound and your camera is muted. So if you have a question or a comment, you can always type it in the Q&A box that you see at the top or bottom of your screen at any time. If it's a technical question, one of our producers will be on hand to help you uh, and we can resolve that. If you've got a question for Liz, ask it any time and we'll collect those throughout the talk and then we'll get to as many as we can live at the end. And so now uh, it is my very great pleasure to welcome once again, Liz Lev, our fantastic lecturer. I know you guys are gonna be just as excited as I am about today's talk. Um, I can't wait. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Liz. Liz, welcome. Well, thank you for having me back. And I have to say, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this talk too. Um, we're finally, well, we, I, I'm interested in all about the grand tour, but somehow when we talk about women who moved to Rome and found success and a great life there, somehow it really resonates with me. So I'm very, very excited to enter into the part of our uh, lecture, which will be about the women uh, who we will meet in the grand tour. And so let's see, we'll get these up and running. Um, it's an interesting thing to realize that uh, one of the most important things you probably wanna know is that this is not a new thing for women to be traveling to Rome. I think something that's, that's good to remember is the fact that there was a very important precedent set for women traveling, women traveling even alone, back in the fourth century. And the person who set that precedent was the mother of Emperor Constantine, Flavia Elena Augusta, who in around 328 decided to go in search of the, of the cross, of the true cross. And that is the reason why her successful rediscovery of the cross that Jesus was crucified on is the reason why we have the Church of Holy Cross in Rome and is the reason why we have fragments of the true cross scattered all over the world. But for our point today, what Helena Augusta did was even more significant in that she said she opened a bunch of hostels and places for women to stay in the Holy Land so that in the successive centuries, in the 400s and the 500s, we see a series of women travelers, including uh, the two um, the two spiritual directees of St. Jerome, St. Paula and her daughter Eustochium. Uh, we also meet a woman from Spain whose name was Melania, who was a famous pilgrim. And one of the most interesting pilgrims of all was a woman who probably came from Gaul. Her name was Egeria. And the reason why she's so interesting is because she leaves us travel literature. So we have a history in the Christian, in Christianity of women traveling and leaving us travel literature. And actually the book that Egeria leaves behind of her travels is a very, very important document for understanding early liturgy. Well, what do you know? That's going to be the genesis of our grand tour, our women of the grand tour. What are they doing? How do we know them? Because they too are writers. And so I'm presenting you three sort of right off the bat, three of the great female figures of this age. Um, for the most part, I'm going to be talking about artists, because obviously being patrons of the arts, me being an art historian, but I think it would be nice for you to get a, a, a view of these really remarkable figures who come to Rome in a period where it's really not terribly easy. So uh, we'll have Lady Anna Riggs Miller, who will um, come to Rome. And not only that, but she is the one who begins the whole travel writing genre. And so for very complicated reasons, 
she ends up having to move from England to live in France. And during her time in France, she comes into Italy and she writes letters back to her friends about what her travels are like. And that eventually becomes this, this travel literature, which are her letters from Italy describing the art and the customs. Even earlier, Anne-Marie Fiquet du Bocage, uh, her husband was a, a sort of very important diplomat. And so she traveling with her husband also leaves a, a body, an epistolary body of correspondence, which again helps people to try to shape and imagine what it would be like to come to Italy. So from, a, oh, I could never go there. I can't imagine going there to the, well, wow, they went. I wonder how I could do that. And the last woman in the lineup is particularly dear to me, Anna Brownwell Jameson. Uh, she is the very first Anglo-Irish art historian. She's the first Anglophone art historian. And so she came to, um, Rome in the first in the first decades of the 1800s and she again very very dear to my heart will be the one who in a world where the grand tourists are very secular and mostly interested in the ancient ruins and what we can see of, of ancient Rome and the ancient sculptures, uh, Anna Bronwell Jameson is the one who's going to look at the religious art and she will write, this is a two volume, very, very, very important book where she tries to write about the stories and the legends behind the sacred art that you're seeing. So, I mean, she really is in many ways, uh, my great, my, my predecessor and very much my inspiration. We Again, a traveler who came in the early years of the 1800s and left this body of literature studying the art here. And this is how these women really find a very important place in their society. But the one that is going to knock your socks off is our Mariana Stark. Now, Mariana Stark uh, undertook the voyage to Rome in rather desperate situation. Everybody in her family, her mother, her father, her sister, they all were suffering from tuberculosis. And they were told that perhaps the Italian air would do them good. So Mariana Stark, the only healthy person in the family, accompanied her whole family through France, from Lyon, down to Nice, into Geneva, and then to Rome. Tragically, she lost both her father and her sister on, on route, and she managed to get her mother back home, but then her mother died shortly there afterwards. But the fact of the matter is, Mariana Stark's experience traveling in Rome in the 1780s, traveling through Italy and France in the 1780s, started as letters and then developed into something else. And so here you have information, directions for travelers to the continent. You are not going to believe me, but I'm telling you the truth. Mariana Stark is the very first guidebook writer. The kind of guidebook that we're accustomed to seeing today was invented by this woman who, this is a page from her book here on the right, where she talks about, this is my very, very, very beautiful line, um, a few particulars relative to expense at the present moment on the continent, that families induced by prudential motives to reside in foreign countries may neither have the mortification of finding their plans defeated by the extravagance of a courier, or neither, nor, nor by the impositions frequently practiced upon strangers. She gives helpful guidance. So this page you see here is how much, it's like when you come in and you say, how much are you supposed to pay for a taxi? She gives you that information. She's the first person to start thinking, she even developed a rating system. So in order to kind of classify what are the most important things to see, she put in exclamation points. And yes, you guessed it, that is the, that is the predecessor, that is the ancestor of the star system all invented by this remarkable English woman who came here really serving her family and found herself this incredible calling as the origin of guidebook writers. Now, as we were saying last week, the Vatican museums in the meantime are opening for all of these people. There's no uh, uh, restriction about who can enter the Vatican museums. You don't have to hold up your Catholic card. You don't need to be a man. It's a museum that is really opened from this point on. It's open to everybody. And we have these lovely contemporary engravings where we see, I showed you this last week, uh, families, the rather surprising edition of dogs, which uh, good luck bringing your dog into the Vatican museums today, the addition of children. And so the Vatican museums are now welcoming everybody, including 
these you know, remarkable women who are coming from all over the place. And that means there are certain responsibilities. With this new audience, they have to change a bit the way they put the works on display. It's different from back in the day when the museum was first opened in 1506 and it was Michelangelo and Raffaello and Bramante were just hanging around looking at the nude figures, it didn't matter. But now it does because there's the awkward position of these women who are going to be standing side by side with men looking at these works of art in an era when modesty was still you know, a word that people used and thought about. As a matter of fact, I'll just give you a tiny little personal parenthesis. I've been studying art since I was 16 years old and I've been in museums all over the world, usually by myself because nobody ever wanted to spend as much time in the museums as I did and I can promise you I have been, I've been accosted a million times by creepy guys next to statues, like their favorite thing, like you're standing in front of a nude statue and somebody comes like creeps up next to you. So I completely understand why the Vatican Museums made the decision to cover its work with fig leaves. And this was actually in addition, not bunned on by a prudish church that couldn't handle the sight of the human body, but a, but a church that was trying to be responsible. As a matter of fact, one of the most glorious rooms in the Vatican Museums, this I think is actually my favorite room in the Vatican Museums. It's the Gabinetto delle Maschere, and perhaps some of you who have been on these wonderful trips, these patron trips to Rome, um, you've been to the gala and you can go in, they open this room especially in the evening galas and it's got, uh, it's got actually, it's a door that has to be opened with a lock. It's a very small room filled with the most beautiful female statues uh, that they have in the collection. So the various crouching Venuses, the, the, the mosaics on the floor from Hadrian's Villa, the three graces. But what this meant was that if you were walking into that space, you knew what you were getting into. It's not like walking through the Musée d'Orsay and when you least expect it, you turn a corner and there you find yourself in front of Courbet's Origine du Monde, which is a very surprising painting to find out of the blue, if any of you are aware of which painting I'm talking about. There were even new masterpieces made uh, in that period, and they were made already with the fig leaves in mind. And I know some of you are the Northwest patrons, so you know this story very, very well. Um, the uh, paint, the sculpture of Perseus Triumphant made by Antonio Canova, who we'll be talking about next week. Canova will be the star of our lecture next week. Um, Canova uh, produced these three sculptures after uh, the Vatican collection was somewhat depleted by Napoleon, again, a subject we're going to take up next week. But he made the statue of Perseus, which is being constructed in 1800, understanding that the fig leaf question was something that it would have to have, that they would expect the work to have a fig leaf. And so the fig leaf was actually removable. It has Northwest patrons that went to see it. It has a little hook so that the fig leaf could be put on and taken off according to the circumstances. So again, it's a museum that really got used to adapting to its different people. And that brings me to the thrust of our afternoon where I am going, or morning in your case, where I'm going to introduce you to some of the exceptional women who really flowered in this city. And I'm going to start with Angelica Kaufman, who is a Swiss German painter. As uh, you see, she was born in 1741. She was celebrated worldwide. Very, very good friends with Johann Goethe, who loved her very much. Uh, she was referred to, I think this got to be the most wonderful compliment, perhaps the most highly cultured woman in Europe coming from philosopher Johann Herder. And this wonderful line when she will eventually go to England, uh, the whole world is Angelica mad. Now imagine a world before you have Instagram and Facebook and you know other ways of getting a gazillion followers. By the time she left Rome to go to, to, go to London, everybody was talking about the Angelica Kaufman, who was extraordinarily gifted in two different fields. She was on one hand a beautiful singer. She was the daughter of an opera singer and she had a beautiful singing voice. And she was told very early on by a prelate, stay away from the world of opera. It's a bit of a sink. And so uh, she ended up going with her other great talent, which was painting. She was something of a child prodigy already producing portraits when she was 11. But you see this painting that she does later on in life at 1794. 
before when she does this work showing herself torn between her two loves music and art and 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 it is a love it's kind of it's it's a it's a very very clever painting based on ideas of you know, which one is going to bring you to glory and so you see the image of um painting in the blue and much sort of the, the sort of the, the color of the Virgin Mary, if you will, uh, pointing upwards to the to the temple on the hill because this is the art that will bring her glory. And so she reluctantly leaves the soft presence of music. Remember at this point, by the way, there's a kind of a something you have to remember when you realize this decision between music and art, because I'm sure some of you are musicians that are sitting there going, what? Um, there was no way of recording voices. And so your singing performance dies with you. And so there was no way of keeping that for posterity. Music was the ultimate form of vanitas because it was there one moment. And then when the instrument stopped and you stopped singing, it was gone. And so this sort of choice between the two uh, painting because paintings would last become a question of glory. So here is her tree or her travels. Uh, she goes uh, from Switzerland, she heads into Germany. She spends some time in Northern Italy. Then she makes her way down to the papal States and then zip off to London, which is when the world goes Angelica mad. And it's interesting because I'm, I'm making this little stop in London because uh, even though she's already friends with Johann Joachim Winkelmann, who will be ultimately the first curator of the Vatican Museums, he comes to Rome in, uh, in, in, he comes to Rome in the 1700s, we talked about him, and in, uh, he's, he's, he will become the first curator of the Museo Clementinum. Uh, he uh, met Angelica Kaufman and was taken with her, and she did his portrait, and then of course here is her portrait of Goethe from later on, but the fact is she already comes to Rome very young and makes very, very important friends, and then this incredible thing when she goes to London, uh, she comes from Rome where we've had a painting academy for centuries. We've had a painting academy since the 1600s. And she goes to London and together with Mary Moser, who you see on the right, a still life, life painter, and uh, Joshua Reynolds, she is one of the founders of the London Academy of Art, which is again, really kind of an exciting thing to see that, that the, 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 the Royal Academy of Art already from its very foundation includes these two women. Actually, they're part of the foundation, they're part of the founding. And this is just an example of how these works would have been displayed in Somerset House in the exhibition room. Now, there's a very interesting point, which brings us right back to the nudity question. Women are at a bit of a uh, disadvantage. In, um, in art. And the reason is that they are not invited to do, they're not allowed to be present during an anatomical studies from life. So this is an image of the newly formed Royal Academy of Art in London. There is a lesson going on in drawing a live model. So you have one nude model here, another one who is getting undressed here, and you see the models of the bodies, and you see the, the, the anatomical figure in the background, so that these artists can learn about modeling the human body. But unfortunately, Mary Moser and Angelica Kaufman cannot be present for these types of lessons. So in their honor, in this picture of this sort of special advanced class, they put the portraits of the two women founders over in the corner. So they can be there in their pictures, but they can't be there personally. And this will actually turn into something that a bit, it hobbles Angelica Kaufman in that in her drawings, virtually everyone always complains that her male, male figures, as you can see here, look like female figures because she doesn't have enough experience drawing the male anatomy. And that's going to be a constant uh, a complaint leveled against her. The other thing that she finds in London is no small amount of sexism and a certain, a certain amount of discrimination because of the fact that she is young and beautiful. And she is immediately favored by Joshua Reynolds, who is about you know, 30 years older than she is at the time. 
to that point, uh, she makes a point of having this, she gets, she's married during the time uh, she is uh, in London. She gets married. It's a terribly scandalous, disastrous marriage with a man who apparently was already married. So she's married. She's already got this problem of the scandal with Joshua Reynolds. And it turns out that this man that she's married is a bit of a bounder. And Nathan Horn, who is a painter in London and very, very jealous that he wasn't chosen by Joshua Reynolds to be part of the team to decorate St. Paul's Cathedral. You can see St. Paul's over here. Does this incredibly obnoxious satire of, uh, of Angelica as one of his painters. So do you see here's St. Here's, um, this is supposed to be Joshua Reynolds looking like a kind of old, corrupt, sick old man. And then you can see this background. One of the figures here is a female figure with long hair, wearing stockings, brandishing her paintbrush like a sword. So this was kind of like people joking and make, making fun of her and suggesting that, of course, the reason why she had got the job was because essentially she had slept her way to the top. And so she married again, a nice Italian, Antonio Zocchi, who was also a painter, and she returned to Rome. And she came back in 1782, where she became outrageously popular and wealthy. And when I called her the Fortune 500 painter, it was because she was churning out paintings left and right. As a matter of fact, Goethe would tell her to slow down. You don't need to work so much. You, you, you have all the money in the world. And so he often blamed her husband who said he was making her work too hard, but she produced history paintings. Look at these, these beautiful works and the grand tourists are coming and they're fascinated by the stories of antiquity and they want to hear, they, they're enchanted by the story, uh, story of Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi, who you see here on the right. Cornelia, who's uh, uh, went to visit a friend and her friend was taking out her jewels and saying, look at these jewels and look at those jewels and look at all the jewels I have. And Cornelia brought her two sons, you see the two boys, her two sons together and said, well, these are my jewels. So that very, very famous line, which was famously repeated by Sophia Loren after her house was robbed. But what really catapulted, I mean, truly catapulted, um, uh, a, 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 Angelica Kaufman to a whole new stratospheric form of well, where she became a designer. So it's kind of like, you know, Versace made fabulous couture clothes and then he started designing things. So did Armani, so did Prada. And so this idea of translating her style into something that could be mass produced often with the Sevres company. She worked a lot with the Sevres company. And so these incredibly beautiful, all of these wonderful pieces of China and, and, and teacups and, 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 and decorations for the house with her designs put her into this whole new level of really a successful uh, designer, businesswoman, artist, really kind of, she's the early Miucha Prada, if you will. And to culminate all of this, she comes to the city of Rome and who comes a calling but Pope Pius VI. Pius VI, if you remember, is the man who is opening the brand new Vatican Museum. The museum will now be the Pio Clementino under him, the man who has the vision of a museum that's gonna talk to the, uh, the new enlightenment world. And he is the first person to engage this new exciting world by hiring Angelica Kaufman to produce a work of, it's a story of the Blessed Virgin when she's a child. And he liked the work so much that he had that made as a mosaic in the church of Loreto, the famous holy house of Loreto. And so I, I wanted to, this, 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 this leads her, I think it's a very interesting thing that this is pretty much one of her last works. And uh, it's Christ and the Samaritan woman. And this is really proper to another type of discussion about art, but I'll try to just open up a little window for you to think about. I find it very fascinating that all of the women who were very successful artists in Rome, uh, eventually choose the subject matter of Christ and the Samaritan women. People get very excited about Judith and Holofernes, and yes, they all do Judith and Holofernes too. But I think Christ and the Samaritan woman is a very, very interesting choice for a female painter, because after all, this is the moment that Jesus chooses the most unlikely person to go back to her people and be the apostle to her peoples. This, the, 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 the Samaritans, the, 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 the people that her village will come to Jesus 
because of this woman who very famously in this gospel passage, Jesus points out that, yeah, you've had five husbands and the one you're with is not your husband. So she's got an irregular life. Uh, she's got, she's, got she's, she's very clearly beautiful because she's detracting husbands left and right. And Jesus uses this extraordinary woman as this woman as his extraordinary vessel to bring people to him. And I think it's fascinating that there's so many women artists who love to show this topic. And I think it's very significant in realizing that what it meant for them to be successful in Rome is that they get to take a part in this world of evangelization, which, at which Rome is the center. And so uh, she, when she died, this work was so important that when she died, um, there was a funeral organized for her by Canova. It was Antonio Canova who organized a funeral for Angelica Kaufman, which was meant to be identical to that of Raphael's. This is a painting that shows the funeral of Raphael, where a hundred candles were brought into procession as he was being brought to being laid to rest. All the painters in Rome came out to pay homage to him. He was carried through the city with his best painting of the his painting of the Transfiguration, which was being brought with him to be placed above his tomb. Same thing Canova organized for Angelica Kaufman. A hundred painters, hundred all the painters in Rome, a hundred candles, and her painting of Christ and the Samaritan woman being carried through the city until she was laid to rest in the church of Sant'Andrea delle Frate, which is very close to the Spanish steps. And you can still see on the side wall, uh, the site of her tomb and uh, the, the, commemorative, the commemorative plaque for her tomb and that of her husband. So very, very successful story. There's a very interesting epilogue in the life of Angelica Kaufman, and it's connected to um, this painting in the Vatican Museums. I think most of you know that we have the only Leonardo da Vinci painting in Rome. Um, it's uh, it's an unfinished image of St. Jerome. As a matter of fact, it went to the Metropolitan Museum of New York a few years ago as part of this sort of big excitement for the uh, death anniversary of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, this painting was in the possession of Angelica Kaufman when she died in 1807. And when she died, it was, it just disappeared from her belongings. And it wasn't found until several years later by Cardinal Joseph Finch, who happens to be the uncle of Napoleon. And he found it, if you, if you know the story, it was found in several pieces, including this single piece you see here, which was the head of St. Jerome. And that piece was found in a cobbler shop being used as a footstool. And so it was reconstructed and then the painting made its way into the Vatican collection. So we have this work left over from this exceptional woman's uh, collection. Then uh, another little figure who I just thought you might not realize uh, spent some time in Rome is Elisabeth Vigée Le Brun, Marie-Louise Elisabeth Vigée Le Brun. But for obvious reasons, I kind of stuck with just Elizabeth. And she obviously is a French painter. Uh, she was a French painter who was um, of a uh, of, of a very very important family. So this is what Paris looks like when she's a, a young woman. Uh, she will um, marry into the family of, uh, of 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 the of the of the artist Bouet. So she's very 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 uh, very very well, very well placed to have good connections. As a matter of fact, uh, her her. her uncle or uncle-in-law uh, did a portrait of Benjamin Franklin during his time in Paris. And she actually studied for a while under uh, Boucher, but then Boucher, who was kind of the painter to the royal court, died. And she pretty much took his place. Now, you know, uh, you know her from her extraordinarily beautiful images of herself and her daughter. So the reason why uh, um, Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun will be familiar to you is either this painting, which is clearly based on her study of Raphael's Madonna della Sedia, so this kind of wonderful way she depicts her daughter, or this one here, which I think it's in the Louvre, it's one of the most beautiful mother-daughter paintings in the history of anything. She got into all kinds of trouble in the Salon for this. They were very shocked and, and, and upset because in her paintings with her daughter, she's smiling and her teeth are showing, oh dear me. But at any rate, uh, after this launch in the Salon, she was very successful, she was eventually called to Versailles by Marie Antoinette. And so Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun was, more than anything else, the official portraitist of 
Marie Antoinette. So when Marie Antoinette wanted to dress up like a country girl, there's Elizabeth. When she wanted to dress up like the intellectual diplomat, there's Elizabeth. When she wanted to show herself as the loving mother, there's Elizabeth. So this myriad of images of Marie Antoinette, but just lovely and wonderful and made her very wealthy and incredibly successful until something went a little bit south, south in 1793. And what you're looking at is actually the October 1793 execution of Marie Antoinette at the guillotine. Now, if they're after Marie Antoinette, we all know we all know how cancel culture works. They take the queen and then they start looking for everybody else around who they can get. And so Elizabeth had to leave immediately. And so she left and had the most extraordinarily peripatetic existence. This woman went from uh, France to Germany to Austria to Russia. She lived at the Russian court and painted in Russia before making her way to Rome. So a woman who spoke many different languages like Angelica Kaufman, a woman who was used to travel. And can you imagine how long it takes in a coach to go from France to, to, to St. Petersburg? A woman who adapted to wherever she went. And here in Rome, when she got finally made her way to Italy, she found herself fascinated by the Karachi school. And her artworks began to take on this beautiful, rich tonality, this beautiful type of uh, a fine line and glorious draftsmanship, which is such a hallmark of the artist Domenichino. This is a work that she had actually seen. It was at the Galleria Borghese at the time. And then she kept working as a portrait artist for increasingly eccentric women, including one of the most famous um, uh, figures from the Grand Tour. She wasn't exactly a Grand Tourist, but Lady Emma Hamilton, who liked to have herself depicted in many different ways, not unlike Marie Antoinette. So here she is uh, dressed up as a Bacante. Over here, she's Ariadne, and there are plenty more where that came from. And then at last, the question that you've all been waiting for, the, the, the topic you've all been waiting for, what about the Americans? Well, it's going to take a while for the Americans to come over. It is true. Thomas Jefferson came to France already in the, in, in the, in the last years of the 18th century as a, um, as a diplomat. Um, the, Benjamin Franklin, it's true, yes. But it was a very difficult journey, and it was something that one undertook for diplomatic reasons. The change that will allow the Grand Tour to extend out of Europe and into the new world will be the development of steamships. And you're looking at a steamship from 1850, which it actually made the record crossing in 1851, I believe, um, of nine days to cross from Liverpool, Liverpool to New York. And so uh, this is the great uh, development that allows the Americans, uh, the next, next, next is going to be, the next is going to be planes, the great development that allows the Americans to start coming over the new world, to start to come into contact with the old world. It's been, you know, 50 years since 50 to 50, I said more than 50, 70 years since the Revolutionary War. It's time to start sort of, right, sort of stitching things back together again. And so, um, this particular figure came to one of the first is that if we've got steamships going as of about oh 1847 i would say very dangerous by the way quite a few of them go down and they oddly enough crash with each other a lot which i don't really understand but harriet beecher stowe came here in 1857 and i just wanted to point this out because i think not many people realize that it was harriet beecher stowe who made the italians aware and this is in Italy that's still separate countries. She made the Italians aware of the situation of slavery in the United States because you know, Rome has a long history of slavery. I mean, the Romans kept slaves, and you know what? What? What's the deal? What's the big deal? Um, but what? But when uh, the story of uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, what it came out, uh, it was really a, a, a concept of slavery, which was really it was it was shocking to the Italians. The Italians actually had believed that the Americans were some. Kind Kinds of barbarians because of this, this slavery and what happened the way it was it was translated into popular culture which is fascinating is that in 1857 um, 1857 her book was turned into a ballet 
by a man named George Rota, Giorgio Rota, who was a ball who was a choreographer. And it was called Bianchi e Neri, Blacks and Whites. And it was at La Scala and it was here in Rome. And it became the most talked about, the most interesting, the most visited, the most attended uh, cultural show in the, con in the, in the, in the country. And so this is how the Italians became more and more and more aware, and this was really the great role that Harry Beecher Stowe played, really, if you will, um, uh, uh, this awareness campaign uh, to make people think about what it meant to be a slave in the United States. And in the meantime, we have a rather remarkable group of women who are coming over hard on the heels of, of Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, and they're all going to be sculptors. So all this time, we've been talking about painters, 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 but these women want to break into something that's even more of a man's world, even more prohibited, which is the idea of working with a hammer and chisel and a piece of marble, just as Michelangelo had all those years ago. So here's the Rome that they saw in the 1860s. This is the Piazza Navona back in the day. Uh, you can see the unexcavated forum with the, the, the buried arch of Satinius Severus. No embankments along the Tiber, but the little boats to help people get from one side to the other. And this was the Rome of blessed Pope Pius IX. A pope who at this particular time was with his back to the wall uh, because of the unification of Italy and yet made Rome a welcoming place for everybody. And I mean everybody. So it was a place where all of these artists and, and others uh, came even though that even though uh, success had eluded them or, or they were often found themselves discriminated against. But here in the Rome of Blessed Pope Pius the and Pius the Ninth, it was a very different story. And the first one to come was Harriet Hosmer, who is, uh, she is a rather remarkable figure and you'll forgive me. Um, she's from Watertown, which is the next town over from where, where I'm from. So of course I get really excited about Harriet Hosmer. Uh, her father was a doctor. And so Harriet Hosmer was different from all the other women artists we have met so far. Her father was a doctor, realized that his daughter had a gift for art, wanted to help her and made sure she studied anatomy. As a matter of fact, he succeeded in getting his daughter enrolled in a school in Mississippi, where she, or Missouri, no, Missouri, where she could learn anatomy. So as soon as she learned this anatomy, as soon as she figured out all of the workings of the human body, she had this, if you will, she had this extra degree under her belt. Then she went off to Europe. She came to Rome. Rome was the center. Rome was a place where you could hang out in artist studios and this wonderful, beautiful, fabulous little road called Via Marguta, one of the great hidden jewels right off the Spanish steps and right off the, the Piazza del Popolo. It's a little parallel road. And if you walk down a little ways and turn left, you walk in and see all the studios where the sculptors were working back in those days. And they were all built for Canova and Canova's uh, protégés. And so these women, uh, especially Harriet Hosmer, who had the amount, had the money to do it, was able to get a to 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 get a sculpture and get herself a teacher. And so this is actually an image of her the man who taught her. Um, this is uh, some of her very early work upon arriving in Rome were these busts. And the age is neoclassical, so nobody likes the Bernini flair anymore. They like this much more kind of subdued type of art. But even though Harriet Hosmer is avoiding the kind of Bernini passion. What she's doing is following in the footsteps of three of the most famous artists. We know Leonardo's debut work was a Medusa head. Caravaggio, one of the first things he produced for Cardinal Del Monte, a Medusa head. In the Capitoline Museums, what do we have by Bernini? A Medusa head. So Harriet Hosmer comes ready to take on that, 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 that legacy. Her Medusa obviously is much, much more subdued, but you can see the sort of elegant way the hair becomes snakes in the headdress. And instead of using kind of the usual drapery, she has the snakes come and tie underneath her breasts. 
Um, she does a very famous work called the Zenobia. What makes Zenobia so interesting is the sheer size of it. This is a very, very large statue. And it's the story of a Palmyrin queen. So she's, you know, again, coming to Rome and representing these very important figures of the Mediterranean uh, history. And this is a great image where her work garners her so much fame that the Prince of Wales himself came to her studio. And this was very much the livelihood of these women. They put up, they set up studios in the best possible area they could. And the grand tourists would come and visit their studios. And sometimes they would buy large works, sometimes they'd commission small works, but they would sell most of their works out of, their, out of the country. And so to have uh, the Prince of Wales visiting her studio to see the Zenobia you know, in the works is a very, very important and prestigious thing. The other thing that happens with these women, the other thing these women know how to take advantage of is a kind of early social media. Their, their photography is beginning to really make itself felt in Rome. And so these women will have themselves photographed and these images of them will go out all over the world. So that people are like, wow, I got to go to Rome and meet this woman. And to stand out they wear these very colorful costumes you'll see that in all the women that we're I'm going to show you in the next couple minutes they all wear very interesting costumes so she's like wearing a riding coat here she's wearing a fez and a waistcoat um, as a matter of fact she uh, uh, one of the attractions for her in living in Rome was that she was able to live what we call in uh, what we called a Boston marriage back then with this beautiful actress her name was Charlotte Cushman and so she was able to live her life as she pleased here because it was a place where nobody it's a place where, if you will, who am I to judge? So nobody was really uh, attentive to how, uh, to what their personal lives looked like, except for, except for that's not entirely true. Um, it would be a problem that, that modesty with men was very important. So they had to maintain at least an image of not uh, seeing any men. And so that's kind of an interesting little um, fact about one woman has to leave Rome because she's, she's found out to have an affair with someone. Um, this is, this is uh, again, Harriet Hosmer working on her sculptures. Look how big it is, look how small she is. Again, this is using photography to brilliant effect. And here she is with her studio. This is the little woman here who runs that whole studio. All of those men work for her. So really, a, a, a possibility of success and, 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 and authority that really wasn't, um, wasn't able, wasn't open to her uh, in the US. And then uh, her greatest success is that she is the first artist, American artist, male, female, you name it, to produce a tomb in Rome. She was the only, she was the first one to get a commission from a, an Italian. So it's one thing if you're getting commissions from the Prince of Wales and it, it's another thing to get a commission for a church, a tomb monument for a church in Rome. And in that same Sant'Andrea delle Frate where Angelica Kaufman is buried, Harriet Hosmer was hired to do the tomb of Giulietta Falconieri in 1856, making her the very first sculptor, male or female, from the United States of America to get a commission in, in Italy, which again, huge strides forward. Um, I'm just going to spend two seconds on Ella, Lavinia Ellie Vinnie Reem. Uh, she was remarkable. And I just, I want to show you these pictures again. They're very, very, very clever in how they're using photography to good effect. So these sort of the long ringlets that she uh, sported. Um, this was a medallion given to her by a cardinal who you're going to see in another picture. Um, this kind of, there it is. There's the medallion again. You see her, the sort of, the sort of sweet little girl when she was 17 years old, 17 she won the commission to make the statue of Abraham Lincoln that was going to go in the rotunda. She sat with Abraham Lincoln on many occasions producing his bust portrait and then later the life-size statue. She did the four years of work on the life-size statue she did in Rome where she was visited, protected, and also very um, um, appreciated by Cardinal Antonelli, the Secretary of State of Pope Pius, the, Pope Pius IX, and he is the one who gave her that medallion of Jesus Christ to show her 
her, 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 his, his approval of her work. And here is the statue. This is the statue of uh, Abraham Lincoln, which is still in the rotunda, despite the fact it's had a really love, 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 tough life there, particularly last January. It's this sort of very moving picture where he seems to be sort of suggesting halt. And I'm going to close with uh, a very, very brief overview, too brief, of the woman that I find the most fascinating of all, Edmonia, aka Wildfire Lewis. She is the first African-American uh, sculptor, period, period, male or female. Uh, her whole entire career, all of her success, it comes from Rome, and it comes from the Rome of Pius IX. She was born in 1844. Um, she was born free. Uh, her mother is Native American, her father is of Haitian descent, it's a little nebulous. Uh, she spent most, her mother died when she was nine and spent her very early years traveling around with the Native American peoples in upstate New York. When she was uh, around, oh, maybe 12, 13, her half brother came and sent her to Oberlin, where uh, Oberlin was one of the very few schools where an African American could go for education. And uh, while she was there, however, she got involved. She was she was caught up in what seems to have been a very serious racial incident, which involved her being beaten to within an inch of her life. Frederick Douglass told her to go east to get out of Oberlin and to prepare herself if she wanted to be an artist to go to Europe. From Oberlin, she went to Boston, Massachusetts, which again, I'm always very excited to be able to talk about Boston. Um, these two people were instrumental in helping her. Lydia Marie Child, William Lloyd Garrison, the center of the abolitionist movement in the United States was really in Boston. Um, it was, however, the statue of Benjamin Franklin by Richard Greenaw that was standing in front of the Boston Latin School that a young Edmonia Lewis passed underneath that statue, saw it and was so amazed. Remember that this is in the world, Massachusetts, the United States, we didn't have statues everywhere in the 18, early 1800s, she sees this statue and she says, that's what I want to do. It's a woman who realized her vocation in an instant and then went after that desire to become a sculptor in the face of everyone thinking, but no, I mean, you could, you could, you can probably write or you can probably sing, but the fine arts, you, you can't really want to do the fine arts. And so she has to battle even the people who originally wanted to help her, when they find out she wants to sculpt in marble, they're like, well, why don't you make something in wood? Or you know, maybe you can make some stucco for house decorations. And so she took the advice of Frederick Douglass and ended up in Rome. And in Rome, she joined this group of women that I was telling you about, whom Henry James very unpleasantly referred to as the strange sisterhood of American lady sculptors who at one time settled upon the seven hills in a white Mormorian flock. That is not a compliment. But she will separate herself from the others by producing these, first of all, here are her photo photographs. She too falls, she too follows that kind of interesting way of presenting herself, um, but she will immediately start tackling the questions of um, emancipation. And so she uh, is, is in Rome when the Emancipation Declaration uh, is, is declared, and Methodist Proclamation is declared, and so she will carve this work forever free. And this is her way of describing what this means. She's really, she's, she's part of the story, this position which comes from this, this man and the woman, which comes from uh, the Liberator magazine, which was of course the abolitionist magazine by William Lloyd Garrison. And so this is a very beautiful way of, uh, of, of, of participating in this world of abolition. But even more, even more beyond that, she becomes part of bringing the new world to the old world, right? So all of the artists we've seen, they're all interested in sort of taking scenes from, the, from Homer, from Virgil, or from the Divine Comedy, that great Christian poem that has shaped, shaped the history of art. But in the United States, that divine comedy, that Dante poem, and Dante, of course, is celebrating an anniversary this year, um, was what inspired Longfellow to write the great epic poem of the New World. The Song of Hiawatha is an epic poem about the New World by someone in the New World. What does she do? Not only does she do the portrait of Henry Longfellow, but she becomes the illustrator in stone of Hiawatha 
in Italy. So she comes here and she does all of these wonderful little statues that people come to her studio and they can see this Native American African woman who is illustrating the great American epic poem and you can take it home as a souvenir. Tremendously successful and incredibly important. And again, this sort of way, this is her statue of, of Columbus, this way of celebrating the new world to the old world, kind of bringing, she's the ambassador of the new world to the old world. She will be met by Pius IX, who will actually pay a visit to her studio. And one of her greatest patrons will be John Patrick Crichton Stewart, Marquess de Butte. And the thing about this is that between these two, and Moni Lewis will convert to Catholicism and she will be baptized here in Rome and she will become one of our great, she is a great Catholic artist. And she starts working. This is the, the dress she wore when she, uh, when she met Pius IX. This is her Hagar when she started getting interested in religious subject matter. Not many of it survives. But I'm closing on this work, her most important work. It's called The Death of Cleopatra. The reason why it's so important is if you look at the date, 1876 is the year of our uh, first centennial. And in Philadelphia, there was our very first World's Fair. And Edmonia Lewis was the only person of color who was able to show, the only person of color was able to show in the world's fair. And what did she show? She showed a statue of Cleopatra. Now, as it just so happened, six people showed statues of Cleopatra, William Wetmore Story, uh, Harriet Hosmer. But the fact of the matter is her Cleopatra was a little bit different looking. Her Cleopatra was this, I like this, like the idea, the statue is so tall and she was only five foot four. Um, this, the statue of Cleopatra, instead of showing her as this beautiful, proud queen, which is what everybody else did, Edmonia Lewis remembered that Cleopatra, she's the queen of Egypt. What is the most famous slave holding country in the history of the universe? It's Egypt. Egypt enslaved the Jews. Moses had to lead his people out of slavery. It's the ultimate metaphor for slavery. No way is Edmonia going to show you a glorious Cleopatra who's so proud that she won't walk in the, as a slave to Augustus. Instead, she represented this big, heavy, dead body. And it's a really fascinating work because of the fact that she shows Cleopatra. Remember, we're in the, we are in the wake of the Emancipation Proclamation. Remember, we are in the beginning of the Jim Crow laws. What does she show? The image of slavery personified in Cleopatra, who is dead. Cleopatra is dead. Slavery is dead. The, 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 the abolition movement has won. But the body is still there. There's still the Jim Crow laws. There's still the discrimination. So this beautiful, beautiful way that this woman comes from Rome and really draws out the, the, the next challenges of equality in the United States and something that power and the, 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 the conviction she had came from her time here in Rome. And with that, I am going to stop and uh, open this up. I'm sorry this went a little bit over. I had a lot of women on my plate today and um, I hate to say it, but I really like talking about them. So forgive me if I cut <laughs> into your question time. Not at all. And I, I think um, I probably speak for many of us when I say that I would love to hear another lecture about each of these women individually. It seems like there's so much going on with all of them and they're, they're really fascinating. Um, so if you've got a question for Liz, you can type it in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, as those are coming in, just two quick things that, uh, that stood out. One was we saw the, the three graces at the beginning of your talk and the patrons have just restored the three graces. So a direct connection between some of that, some of that amazing work in the Vatican museums and, and the work that the patrons are doing. Um, we had another, oh, That's sorry, go ahead. Rooms on top of it. Yeah, that, absolutely. That fabulous room. Unbelievable. Um, so one question we have is, um, what, um, what is the, sort of business experience for a lot of these women like? Because you, you touched on, you know, their sort of struggles to 
move through these these art worlds, but then they also seem to be tremendous entrepreneurs and they're setting up these studios and these businesses. And so how much freedom do they have? Are they running their own affairs? Can they have you know bank accounts? Can they control their own their own wealth? How does that work? That is the big change. So um, I was I, I, I did a course this year on women artists in Rome, and it's interesting to see that when we see the first professional female artist in the end of the 1500s, she has to marry because only a man can sign her contracts. But already mm. by the time we meet Angelica Kaufman, and obviously Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun is negotiating her own contracts, um, and then, then when you get to the women, the American women in the 19th century, they are running real businesses. I mean, these are, um, uh, uh, the uh, Vinnie Reams was paying 10,000 for the, um, for the Cleopatra, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Lincoln sculpture. Uh, and Monia Lewis could command up to 20,000 for her sculptures. Um, wow. uh, Harriet Hosmer, was, I mean, they, they're very, very, very successful. And they are very much running their own businesses. And for Edmonia in particular, because, uh, because obviously we just didn't have the, the means of communication, she had to travel usually once a year to the US and kind of bring about, she had to travel with her models and you know, her photographs to really kind of drum up business. Mm. And then, yes, it, it, it's a fascinating, I, I, there's all, yes, you're right, there's a whole long lecture <laughs> on how those businesses were run. And what about um, what about the grand tourists who are women? Are they are they interested in these female artists? Are they not interested? What's the sort of reception from the women who are coming through as part of this part of this grand tour? So again, I, I having way too much material. Um, <laughs> I, I shortchanged the the women who were here. Um, these women are very supported by other women. Um, the there are plenty of women who are coming here. There, Charlotte Cushman was a hugely famous actress. Um, but uh, besides the Duke de Butte, there are a bunch of other uh, women who are, yes, they are very interested in helping these other women. Now there's kind of, a, kind of a strange reverse trap that some of these jealousies that you know they've tried to get away from by coming to Europe, follow them overseas. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of, uh, in, in, in the case of, there, there, there are some cases where, um, there's a case with Nathaniel Hawthorne where his wife really takes a dislike to one of the sculptors and she eventually has to leave Rome. Um, but no, it's, it was generally a really great environment where um, women who were on the Grand Tour would make a point of visiting these, but not just women, women and men. Um, right, right. Was it the uh, the studios? That was what you did, by the way. It was like one of the things. So you know, you're planning an itinerary. Uh, part of if I had been a guide back then, my job would have been to make sure that you got an appointment at Harriet, Harriet Hosmer's and to go see. Oh, you got to go see the Simone Lewis. Oh, you got mm -hmm. that would have mm -hmm. been part of my job. I wish it still were. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be amazing. Um, is there any for? We've had a couple questions uh, to this effect, but is there any? follow-up reading that you would recommend uh, oh, if we want to learn more about some of these women? I'm not to put you on the spot, but no, uh, there, I'm sure there, there is. There is. There's a ton of it. Um, actually, there's a ton of it. Okay. So um, for uh, just coming into mind at the top of my head, um, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful film on Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun. It's really brilliantly done. It's got a really cool way of using some of these pictures, like the ones I have in back of me, and then having it become real. It's really, really cool. You should look up this documentary on Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, and you can read more about her. But in Monia Lewis, she has uh, two biographies, I, I think one that I, 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 I prefer maybe um, is by uh, the Albert and Harry Henderson uh, wrote a, a really very readable and extremely thorough biography um, with all kinds of cool sources. It's only online. I think they self-published it and it's, um, it's only online. You get it as ebook. Um, and there's another one by um, a woman named uh, Catherine Pay Buick which is, um, it's her biography. It's also a lot about what she means for the history of art. So that, that might get a little kind of theoretical for people, but it's a very, very interesting book and extremely well done. And she's, she's really is a foremost um, expert. 
Um, uh, Angelica Kaufman has a very good biography, which I am reading, and I just am completely blanking on the name of the author, <laughs> but I will happily send you along um, a list of the a, a bibliography for these people because they're they're amazing people, and it's an amazing time. Yes, that would be that would be fantastic. And thank you. I know you sent some some reading from last week as well. So if you're watching and uh, you'd like to get some of the recommended reading from Liz, you can just uh, send us an email. Um, all that contact information is in the, uh, the little reminders that you get about the lectures. And so you'll you'll get a follow up tomorrow and you'll you'll see that in there. Um, so a couple of last comments. Um, one of our attendees notes that uh, you can see uh, Hosmer Zenobian chains at the Huntington Library and Art Museum here in Pasadena, which is absolutely right. And it's it's amazing. Um, well worth the well worth the visit. And then last question, and I think this is probably a, a good one to end on, is thinking about the way that you know, for a long time, female artists were just not discussed, not understood as part of the sort of art historical tradition. Have you seen that shift in recent decades? Do you feel like museums and art historians are, are appreciating more the contribution of these women or is it still sort of an uphill battle? So obviously with the Artemisia show that happened in London, except no one's <laughs> if the tree falls, mm -hmm. of course, no one's here to see it fall. Um, uh, the, the Artemisia show, Lavinia has been having, there's a show in Milan right now. There's a lot more going on with female artists. There are two remarkable women who have been working on Angelica Kaufman, who in my opinion is the most underrated of all of them. Um, I think uh, there's been an exhibition on Angelica Kaufman, but there's really no, no real coordinated effort um, and to, to try to understand. And Moni Lewis is having a huge um, uh, 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 revival to the point where I uh, occasionally get concerned that she's gonna be kind of co-opted for the, I, I find her really a fascinating artist because she is living um, prejudice and discrimination and difficulties, first person on her own skin. I mean, she was beaten to within mm. an inch of her life. Yeah. And yet her way of responding is not toppling and destroying. Her way of responding is creating and then engaging with the Western icon and changing a Western icon to transmit her message, which is what the Christians do. It's what the Christians did when we used pagan art to, 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 to transmit the image of who is Jesus. So I mean, I, I, my admiration for her is 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 boundless, and oh, I, yeah. I'm glad that she's getting the attention. I just I, I just hope that that positive aspect of her attention is what's going to come out instead of instead of it being something that sounds more destructive. I just keep thinking this is a woman who became the first African American sculpture because because she saw a statue in a world where we feel comfortable toppling them. And so I, I, I hope she gets the right kind of attention, but she's definitely getting attention. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Liz. This has been a really fascinating talk and I, I have so much reading to do. I really, I'm really looking forward to learning more about some of these incredible women you've introduced us to today. Um, just a reminder for all of you that, of course, these lectures are presented uh, free of cost by the California and Northwest chapters of the Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museum. The Vatican Museums are now open again in, in limited capacity, but, but open again uh, to visitors, and we hope that they'll be able to remain open in the in the coming days but of course it has been a very difficult time for the museum as it has been for for everyone so your support is always very much appreciated to continue the work of restoration that goes on all the time whether the doors are open or closed and uh, as you saw today that restoration includes works like the three graces um, incredible pieces throughout the collections of the vatican museums always need care and attention and conservation so if you'd like to make a gift you can visit californiapatrons.org donations and that will go to our COVID 19 relief and support fund for the vatican museums thank you so much for being with us today thank you liz thank you to all of you for your questions and we'll see you next time <music>